Hi guys, welcome back to my Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. I'm dead excited to have Shannon Lee with me today. We do an interview with her and it will most likely be a two part interview because there's so much to talk to this, this beautiful guest about. Shannon is a veteran uh, from the United States Army. She has been in the Gulf War and as so many other veterans from that time has had ongoing health problems and that the term Gulf War Syndrome or post-Gulf War Syndrome is, is something that is bantered around, but many people have not even heard about it. And those people that have heard about it, well, there's so much weird information out there. So I thought we're gonna take the, the chance to actually listen to this beautiful woman who, who has lived it and is still living it and but has found ways to deal with chronic disease in in the most beautiful way and so i'm dead excited to have shannon on my show today welcome shannon hi stefan thank you so much for having me i'm excited to speak with you today mm, thank you so much. Um, i'm intrigued to start off with uh, were you always, were you born into a military family or what were the, the reasons that you joined the army? What made you go? Well, um, you could say, I wouldn't say it was a military family. I was not a military brat in any way. Um, I had a few family members. Both my grandparents were in uh, the military and uh, my grandfather on my father's side was in the army. My grandfather on my mother's side was in the Navy. And I had a few um, other military members that went in. And so when I decided to go in, it was actually a little bit, um, not anything I had planned, uh, to be honest with you. It was a, a little bit of a whim. <laughs> and uh, because I was, um, I'm from upstate New York, which uh, in a very, 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 very small town. <laughs> and so um, I just decided that um, after I'd gone through a couple years of college and I really wasn't, um, I really just enjoyed working more than I enjoyed studying. Uh, <laughs> per se, I would rather be working, making money than sitting in, you know, uh, <laughs> studying some stuff. And, you know, I was studying business at the time and, um, you know, it just it got to be um, like, I felt like I was just pouring out money for something. I really wasn't quite sure if that's the direction that I wanted to go. And I thought, well, this would just be, you know, the prerequisite stuff that you have to get through to decide what you want to do. So that's what I was doing. And I really felt like it was a waste of money. And so um, I just decided that uh, I always wanted to travel and really wanted to learn something um, more hands-on, you know, and that was, uh, the military seemed like a great place to go for that and to see the world. And they certainly don't fall short of delivering for that. So I did join the Navy. Now I considered the Air Force, but um, they, uh, I, I joined the Navy first, basically. And I, I guess that's just what was in the cards for me. So <laughs> what and that's what no, that's brilliant. Did you go in as a crunt, so to speak, or as a, as a, as a, I don't know what the, the equivalent uh, terminology right. is, or did you go yeah. in as a, a, with the view of becoming a specialist, a certain trade or so? Right. Yeah, they do. There's a number of different occupations that you can go in under. And so at that time, uh, I was 1991. <clears throat> and um, when I took the test, I, they gave me basically two options. And it's funny, we were talking about this earlier today. So um, the only real, what they thought option that they gave me was to go into intelligence. Nice. Uh, yeah. And they, they glamorize it and they make it sound wonderful. And, you know, you can go to Germany and you can go to France and you can go to Europe and you can, you know, they were playing to my, my, uh, my appeal to want to travel, you know, um, but, uh, or, I could go in as I could wait six months to go in and choose whichever job, you know, that I wanted to do, or I could go in in six days and be the bottom of the barrel. 
<laughs> I could scrub decks or, you know, whatever. And so um, I decided that uh, I did not want to be an in intelligence because there were certain things that I did not want to know at that time. And um, all, as glamorous as it sounded, I thought it was also a little bit dangerous for me. And, um, and so I decided that I would uh, choose the lower totem pole and go in. Because if I waited six months, I wasn't going to go. So I had to go in six days, which meant I had to go in and decide what I wanted to do, had to look around, see what was going on and decide what I wanted to do from there. So that's what I did. And and there's, it was a, there's a lot to be said about that, isn't it? That you actually have a really good look around and actually get an inside view rather than what you have seen on NCIS or what you have seen on any kind of other, other wherever source of, of misinformation you got it from. Yeah, um, exactly. So no, I utterly understand that. And for me, that's 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 uh, rings a bell because my young man is just going as a grunt into the mm -hmm. New Zealand infantry. So mm -hmm. and he he chose grunt rather than actually an occupation or officer or etc. So it is it is what it is. Yeah. So there you were, and it was 1991. So interesting times. Yes. Um, Very interesting time, um, Bill. Mr. Bill Clinton was in office, ex-president Bill Clinton was in office, and they were uh, demantling, they were breaking down a lot of the, um, breaking down a lot of the military, they were, they were decommissioning. And so, and, and no surprise, because for those of you who, who are a bit bit weak on the history side, 1989 was basically the wall came down. Russia, as the big mighty enemy, basically dissolved uh, over a short period of time, and suddenly, you know, all dressed up but no place to go, as far as the American military was concerned, at least from this big enemy Cold War picture that was so prevalent from 1945 or 42, really, onwards up until 1989. And here you came in, 1991. <laughs> Great, what are we doing with you now? Uh, right. <laughs> never sort of acquired a, a lot of change within the, the whole armed forces in the United States, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it was, um, and so I, uh, when I went in, I, was undesignated, which means you didn't have a job. You could be put wherever you could. And at that time, they were just allowing women on ships as well as a permanent duty station. So they were making all the range. Tail hook, by the way, had just recently happened too. So that was um, that was an interesting time. And so they were letting women on the boats. And um, fortunately for me, I went to boot camp in Florida, in Orlando, Florida, and they actually closed that base down after I left. And then I went to uh, San Diego to NAS Miramar. So people may be familiar with the movie Top Gun. That was NAS Miramar in San Diego, California. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. So that wasn't a bad duty station, right? <laughs> I was about to say, I mean, you could have chosen far worse places, okay? Yeah, or, exactly. Well, in actual fact, you don't really choose, is it? The Navy chooses yeah. for you. Yeah, the Navy chooses yeah. for you. Well, they give you, you know, they kind of make it like you have some choices. <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 but, yeah. you know, really when you don't have a designated job, they'll send you wherever they want you, need you, or whatever it is. So, um, so my choices were like Norfolk and San Diego and awesome. some places. Someplace else sunny and beautiful because I was from upstate New York and tired of the snow. <laughs> so, well, so far, everything sounds like a dream come true for a young woman who seeks adventure yeah. and travel. So, yeah, hey, what are you complaining? Right. There was no complaint. No, it was a great, it was, it was a really good duty station. I went to a squadron and um, in, and I was on the, um, because I was in the Navy, you have an option to either work in the aircraft portion or work in the ship portion. And so I worked, chose to work as an, uh, an airman on the air aviation side, because I was really loved planes and fascinated by planes. And so um, I went to that side and I went to uh, the E2, um, E2, C2 planes, you know, the propeller planes and the, um, the ones with the big pancakes on top that have the, you know, sonar radar kind of stuff. 
And so uh, I chose to work. Uh, normally, those people that go in there, they either go to first lieutenant, which is basically a janitor, or you go to the <laughs> you go to the flight line and you wash airplanes. Um, I was really, really fortunate, uh, very blessed. I had a, a really wonderful um, master chief who who saw me, talked with me, and he said, "I'm not going to send you out there. I'm going to put you in the tool room." And uh, I want you, you can decide what you want to do from the tool room. I made a lot of women that were pregnant washing planes very upset. And so <laughs> people would, everyone would ask me what, because women that were pregnant were put in the tool room for their light duty. And so um, everyone assumed for the first, forever, however long that I was pregnant. And they're, they're like, are you pregnant? And I'm like, no, why do you ask? <laughs> Because <laughs> I didn't know, you know, I didn't know at the time. But everybody kept asking me if I was pregnant. I'm like, do, do, do I look pregnant? fat in that overall? Right. I was like, why does everyone ask me if I'm pregnant? No, I'm not pregnant. So, and it was funny. And yeah, so, and the pregnant women were not happy, but that's what the chief did. So, and then I did, um, because I was in the tool room, they're attached to supply. And you're basically, it's this rotatable, you know, um, tools that, that each squadron has to use or not the squadron but the the um the job you know airframers and mechanics they all bring these tools in and out of the tool room and they check them check them in check them out every day but it's part of the supply and so i did actually uh got into the supply and, and struck as a supply sort storekeeper so so far so good um a yeah. solid career so to speak you're lucky in your career But then the world again changes. Yes, it did. Uh, two years went by and I expected to be at that squadron for four years. Two years went by, they decommissioned um, the squadron. In fact, they changed the entire base of Miramar to a mil uh, Marine base. So they were closing, uh, all the Navy people were being shipped out to other places. And we had the option to get out. They gave us an early out option. And um, I was not ready to do that at that time. Uh, you know, I just, I had set my mind to four years minimally and um, I wanted to, I wanted to know more. And so I stayed in and they transferred me to uh, NAS North Island, just down the road uh, in Coronado, beautiful Coronado, California. And, uh, and I went to base supply. So now this is a bigger picture of what goes on in the world of supply in the military. So it was very, very mm -hmm. interesting. And, um, and again, I was very blessed to be able to uh, get into a position that gave me a lot of different experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, and in learning how it worked uh, in the world, because, you know, we had these uh, computers and, I was basically in what's, um, I had to find parts, decommission ships and would their parts bring, get them in the proper, into the base rotatable pool, looked all over the world because the ships go all over the world, right? And they leave parts here and they leave parts there. And you're like, okay, you're supposed to account for all these things. <laughs> so, but it was a great position and, and, um, and that was wonderful. But during that time, um, at some some point, which I believe was probably shortly after um, getting into the military at the time that it was, we did, you know, you go through a certain um, check-ins with your health and everywhere you go and they want you to do these things. And because it was uh, Gulf War time and you could potentially uh, go overseas or go on a boat or whatever, they did require that you went on a boat um, so many times while you were there. So it was required that we got uh, vaccinations. Um, we did not know what were in those vaccinations. We were not told what were in them. And we were also told um, that uh, they were supposed to protect us from, um, if we did go overseas uh, from certain biological, chemical, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, and they said, but uh, we don't talk about this. And a lot of times it wasn't uh, actually written in people's records. I've, oh. I've heard. Oh. Yeah, but it wasn't written in the records and we don't talk about it. So, yeah. And so we didn't. 
because we're like, okay, because your your basic choice is you either get those vaccinations or that's the way out the door. Mm. And that has been around for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades that military used its soldiers for fact finding let's call it positive yes. fact finding <laughs> yes. what, ha what happens yeah. if i if i line up a whole bunch of sailors and let them watch an atomic explosion let's see what happens right yeah. exactly yeah. um yeah. And sometimes you're lucky and <laughs> there are these beautiful shots from the 60s where they injected uh, a whole uh, um, many platoons uh, with LSD and then sent them over there, fight me the enemy. And you can find it on YouTube. It's hilarious. These guys, they just can't. They crush it. I don't even want to go there. Uh, yeah. Just to say, that was actually quite a pleasant experiment. Many other right. experiments don't end up like that. Right, and I think that that certainly, uh, as far as the Gulf War was concerned, and round about that time, there were for sure great concerns with regards to weapons of mass destruction, and there were certainly hopes by those people who were responsible for the navy, for the army, to minimize casualties in mm -hmm. the case of something like that being deployed against American forces. So it makes sense that you try to protect your soldiers. Um, of you. course, the way that, that, uh, that many governments and military forces go about this kind of seemingly positive protection, and then what happens when things don't end up so well, that's another story. So, right. and I guess, guys, when you're listening to that, there's already now the inkling here that, that um, maybe vaccinations might be one of the reasons that army personnel and navy personnel fell sick uh, in, in large numbers around about the time of the Gulf War. And it was, it was labeled Gulf War syndrome. And I remember when I was going to university in, in the 80, oh, in the 90s, early 90s, uh, reading about it. And, and at that time, um, people were pointing towards depleted uranium, towards the, 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 the battlefield fumes, the fact that there were oil wells burning left, burning. right and center. There was a huge amount of environmental pollution that yes. the soldiers on the battlefield lived in, breathed in, the same, the same shit as in Vietnam War, Agent Orange. They, yes. You know, the, the soldiers were bathed in that shit. And surprise, surprise, then later on, cancer, cancers came along. So right. when I read first about the Gulf War Syndrome, it was, yeah, no surprise, if you shoot all these interesting weapons and then breathe in the oil, no surprise, you get sick. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do you think about that that explanation of soldiers falling ill and staying ill for a long time. That is absolutely uh, one of the factors as well. A absolutely. However, because anytime you get a chemical, you know, chemicals in your body that don't belong there, your body doesn't know what to do with them. And um, being in supply, I did work in the, in the squadron in hazardous waste. So I, and being in that, we also learned a lot about chemicals and, um, you know, different agents that would go in your, you know, that we used basically that we were around. But what we didn't realize, of course, was the effect that they have on the human body. Um, you know, we understood like, you know, the isotopes and the weights and, and all of that stuff. But what does it do to your body and how do you protect yourself? And so... Um, when you get the vaccines, they have, uh, there is a report out uh, that was written by um, Mike Adams, who is the health ranger. And he was an army guy. He was an army ranger. And he was actually the reason that I even learned that Gulf War illness was what I had experienced. Because I just thought that I, I just didn't feel well, you know, and I couldn't, I, I didn't have the the explanation and the understanding that it came from that until I read that report. And I realized when they said 
there's anthrax, bubonic plague, swine, you know, swine flu, bird flu, every everything imaginable in those vaccines. And the whole point of a vaccination, it's based on, you know, homeopathy, which is you put a little bit of this in something so that your body builds up these antibodies and immunity to it. However, um, all that stuff at one time, that's like, you know, (laughs) you know, in your body. And so, um, you know, that to start off, that's really gives your immune system a super like punch in the face. And then it's got to try to recover from that. Then you're going over. And like you said, yes, burning oil, um, different kinds of, of other chemicals in the environment along with, um, you know, all those chemicals in your body from the vaccinations, you just, you're overloading your liver, your liver can't, can't deal with it. And then let's not even talk about the, the food that you're given, the the sustenance and the nourishment. <laughs> and I say that sarcastically, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, any soldier will tell you, you know, MREs are not where it's at, you know. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. I, um, I, so you're not having said that, okay, let me, let me go one step outside here to just, again, help our viewers a little bit. Because the, the field of occupational and environmental medicine is not something that too many people know about. Right. Uh, there are some things that even Joe public nowadays knows that, if you breathe in asbestos, yet yeah, you sooner or later die from cancers of the lung and the tissues around the lung. Okay, yeah, that's meanwhile accepted. Smoking, well, yeah, fair enough. You meanwhile get the idea that that probably is not so clever either. But there are actually so many, 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 many more environmental issues out there that many people don't know about or don't want to know about. Right. As, as an example, I, I worked in, in gynecology in the 90s. I did the dissertation in that field. And I worked on, on, on the issue of women having repeated abortions. And there was a subgroup of women there who ended up having um, their first child. Everything is beautiful. They live in Germany. There's hands on. We are a good so what do we do in germany we buy a house we renovate it and in the 90s you wanted to have wood paneling so there we are a husband and a wife painting the wood with this kind of all the uh the pcp laying down all those kind of beautiful things that stop uh wood going bad and and borers etc and there you go so off you go in a hot garage without ventilation and then you put it all up and oh, it looks gorgeous. The first child comes around, mummy stays home. Daddy, through the week, goes shopping, goes working, does all the thing. Mummy stays home. Mummy has one child, and then the abortions start rolling in. And you think, mm. what the heck? And it is PCP and Lindan poisoning. And it's basically the, the wood preservatives uh, that are basically poisoning the woman. Uh, right. Who has got the headaches, who has got the chronic disease, who has got the chronic fatigue, all these mm-hmm. kind of things um, yeah. that they don't know what is coming from. Oh, my God, right. have I got postnatal depression? Have I got this? Have I got that? You know, all kind of avenues are being explored. No one sure. realizes that it is the, the wood that you yourself have painted and put up there. Yeah. That's one of many, many examples out there that we doctors know if you actually carefully look, you come across some very interesting links. Yes. And unless someone looks, you don't find right. the links. It's as simple right. as that. And I guess yeah. that's the problem with the Gulf War. And yeah. you've got another uh, problem there because as you say, no military will give away its secrets because they think, hey, this is actually something that protects our soldiers. We will not tell anyone that we did these vaccinations because we are actually creating super soldiers. We have soldiers. We have soldiers now that survive a chemical or biological weapon attack. Wow, great. Once the other guys die, hey, great. We will definitely not tell anyone about that. So again, you understand that. You understand the secrecy behind it. Uh, You look at it. But Mm -hmm. then here you are having being vaccinated. And I think the the interesting bit now that we need to say is 
Um, obviously, come on, if you had been, I don't know, smelling the oil wells, that is, I give you that, you get sick. But yeah. you actually didn't go to the Gulf uh, until much later down the line, didn't you? Um, I actually never went there. I did go on some boats. I stayed pretty much on the coast of California my full four years. Um, I had, at the end of the four years, they gave me the uh, the option for duty station if I decided to stay in. Um, and one of those duty stations was over in the Middle East. But um, I declined to stay in at that time. So yeah, everything that I experienced was was directly from the exposure that I had from the, you know, the squadron at the squadron level and the hazardous waste that I dealt with, you know, through the airplanes and the jet fuel and, and that kind of thing. And then also on the base level, um, I was a first responder for, um, for fallout. So if there was any kind of nuclear happening, um, I was one of those people that would suit up to go deal with some of that, you know, um, that fallout. And so with that, we had to train. We trained once a month to do that. And that training basically means you're putting yourself in some chemicals. Um, and so that was an environmental factor that played on top of already having those vaccinations. So by the end of or around like the third to fourth year, I started feeling it, you know, really feeling it. What did you actually feel? What actually happened to you? Here you were this bouncy girl who loves adventure, finally gets out of the, the small town. And it's sort of the, the kind of the classic American story, isn't it? Uh, yeah. You see the world, do the adventures. What happened to that girl? Um, yeah, I was very, um, I was also very athletic. Um, so I, I played soccer for a very long time. I actually was one of the only, actually, I say one of the only women, like the only woman <laughs> on uh, the, the intramural all male team in the military, in the, in the Navy. Right. And right. <laughs> so I played with the guys and, and so I was a serious, to me, I was a serious athlete. Like I'm running with the guys. I can, I can play, you know, intramural softball with them and what have you. So, um, so that's to say that I, I had a lot of energy. I, you know, I felt like I didn't have a great diet, to be honest, you know, I'm from upstate New York of German descent, you know, we eat meat and potatoes <laughs> you know? and, and not and cheesecake so and the yes. odd sauerkraut. Come on. Yeah. And the odd sausage. Come the on. Sauerkraut, let's, let's... Yes. <laughs> Wiener schnitzel, you know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, but still not, not the greatest and mix that in with a little bit of Southern California, like best Mexican on the face of the planet <laughs> next to Mexico, you know, <laughs> that's, um, but I was 20 something, you know, I'm, I'm early 20. So I still have a lot of, I still have a lot of, you know, in my mind, the gumption, you know, but my body is starting to break down. So I'm starting to feel, um, you know, some excess weight. I'm starting to feel um, the stress from the military. Um, just the, uh, and, and I compounded it myself, but um, again, because I like to work. So, uh, but I did start feeling uh, just really exhausted. I felt exhausted and and I'm like, I'm just too young to feel this way. Like if you're 25, 26, you're like, ugh, this is terrible. What am I going to feel like, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Like, how am I going to feel if this is how I feel right now? And I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know what to do about it at the time. So I just kept doing the same things that I always did. And it just got worse and worse and worse over the years and um eventually it it hurt to be touched like your skin it was painful um i had now none of these things had um titles at that time they didn't have labels and so all those labels have grown over the years since then so these were just the symptoms that i experienced and so i had some 
uh, neurological um, tics, you know, uh, and what they call restless leg now. Um, but back then, that's I, I didn't know else how else to explain it, you know. Um, but I could definitely feel that there were a lot of things that were not right in my body. And that was sort of two, three years into your Navy service that that started. Yeah. Yep. Uh, initially, of course, you could say, wow, here's this girl, uh, obviously a go-getter, working hard, keeping up with the boys, trying to prove herself again and again on a daily basis, fighting left, right and center. Hey, you're burned out. It's no surprise that you feel like that. That's that's normal. Come on, just just take it easy a bit and you're going to be just fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Did you try to take it easy? Did you try to actually, what would happen on a weekend? It's, let's say you've got a weekend off and um, how would you spend that weekend? Um, I probably, you know, I usually spent it, uh, well, it depends on the timing, but towards the end. So when I was in uh, NAS North Island, um, the last year that I had, I started working uh, an outside job as well. So <laughs> you mean the Navy doesn't pay so well. <laughs> uh, well, correct. I mean, I had gone up in the ranks already very quickly because the, the, the storekeeper position for women at that time was way wide open. And so women could, I literally, I mean, I could have been a master chief in like, you know, a couple more years. It was so they were moving women up so fast. So that was great. I was already at a, um, at a second class, um, petty officer having started at zero. So that's a pretty quick, you know, um, ascension, but, um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue or what I was going to do. And, um, and basically kind of really just to fill my time. And I just, uh, I actually started working at one of the Mexican restaurants across the street from the base <laughs> and, you know, and, Learning all the secrets about the best guacamole. I mean, uh, right. uh, hey, I pay money to do, learn these secrets. Come on. Got, got to bring that back home with me, okay? <laughs> uh, we need yeah. to talk after the show, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And uh, so, yeah, so that's what I did. And uh, so on the weekends, I, I yeah. you know, I'd hike in beautiful California, take, yeah. you know, take a run and hike and work pretty much is what I did. <laughs> But it, again, to a certain degree, you looked actually after yourself. There was therefore that uh, that notion that you did go for a run. You 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 had time out for yourself. That yes. hike means basically you get your mindfulness, you get your your regeneration, your recharging in nature. So you can't say that you that that things that you didn't take action in order to look after yourself? I did in that respect, but I will tell you that I was not sleeping. Ah. Interesting. I was not sleeping. And when you say not sleeping, how would a typical night look like? Um, my brain was always, was always like just moving constantly. Um, so it was, uh, if I went to went to work uh, at the military from seven o'clock to three o'clock. And then I'd go to the restaurant from anywhere from four o'clock or five o'clock till around 10 o'clock. And then I, it was an hour drive home uh, to the desert. <laughs> I didn't live in a teepee, but Santee, it was pretty close to that back then. <laughs> um, and so I, I'd get back at like 11 o'clock and then I'd go to sleep at like around 12 to kind of just wind, wind down. So as you can imagine, also my diet was not good. I wasn't getting any real nutrition per se. So, uh, and I lived on coffee for breakfast and Pepsi for lunch. A bit of tequila then for dinner or? <laughs> yeah, when nobody's watching. <laughs> yeah. Margarita. Again, you, don't, you don't have much time for tequila there in that kind of lifestyle, is it? No, not really. And I don't do really good with alcohol at all. <laughs> I'd be falling asleep. But um, so as you can imagine, trying to go, you know, I got an hour to wind down, go to sleep at 12, but I got to get back up at mm, like 530 ish 
to, uh, I had an hour drive to work, remember, so it took me from six to seven to drive from Santee to Coronado. So it's a little crazy schedule. And okay, we are all young. Come on, we are we right. are bulletproof. We are doing Absolutely. these kind of things. You come yeah. on. It is uh, around about that time. I was working twenty four hours on, twenty four hours off uh, in anesthesia, and it wow. was normal. And you would work twenty four hours. Boom. Yeah. Then you go home, crash and party and do whatever else you need. Uh, well, there was some of that too. Yeah, there was. Exactly. Well, yeah. of course, yeah. you're young. So for yeah. coming out loud, let's not be. Stupid. It wasn't all the time, but there was some of that as well. Yeah, yeah. you know exactly. So, but and and but then again, it is it's okay to crash and burn, maybe for a holiday or for a weekend, and really feel feel tired. Well, I guess that we all do that. But for you, that was not really just a weekend. You were saying, and and already there, the first inkling from me, from a doctor's point of view, uh, normally it doesn't hurt when you touch yourself. Um, so that is a bit of a giveaway that there is maybe a little bit more going. The lousy sleep, unfortunately, some people are, due to a number of circumstances, have atrocious sleep. And that's, that's yeah. a whole different, different thing to talk about. So let's not yeah. focus too well, much on the sleep because if I just don't let you sleep, you will get all the symptoms that yeah, you had for sure. and more. So that's a yeah. huge compounding thing. For but sure. let's, yeah. let's keep that out for a moment. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, just to say my biggest problem with that was the, the restless leg syndrome yeah. would keep yeah. you awake. And then you're, when your mind is still moving because you're thinking about what you need to do the next yeah. day, yeah. that was the biggest yeah. part of it. But yeah, you're right. For those of you out there, restless leg syndrome means that however much you try, your legs keep moving. And it is as, as if they have their own life and it is incredibly upsetting. Uh, mm. It is, I've got a mild version of it, but mine responds really, really nicely with uh, magnesium. So yes. uh, high dose magnesium can be quite a godsend for the milder mm. forms, but you don't expect to have that when you're a young person this is you right think, come on come on how was your mood around that time um that's a good I, I think i was very um looking back on it i think i had a lot more um coming from upstate new york i recognized that i had some sad uh, so going to florida and then from california that kind of lifted but other um hormonal kind of moodiness was a little bit more there you know but i again sad really guys uh sad of course means to be sad but sad in this circumstances means seasonal affective disorder means right. basically because you're living in in darkness for yes. uh, the better part of uh, a year i mean that's that's the uk you've just described for crying yeah, out exactly from october to march april you right. get up in the dark go to work come home in the dark and you think yep. has at any one stage has there been light out there so yes so that is that is what we are talking about so seasonal affective disorder is is a cyclical low mood that hits people with which is directly attributable to the seasons and to the constant darkness so yeah no cool. well and because the sun you know vitamin d was mm. what helped uh lift that mm. For me. But then again, here you were, hang on, you're now in the sun. You are in the desert. You are, yeah. okay, you're out there. Come on. So the yeah. sun is no longer, uh, the darkness is no longer an issue with regards right. to your mood. Right, yeah. Because that had gone. But yeah. how did you feel? Um, I felt uh, very up and down, you know, very up and down. Uh, it was, I'm normally a very um, outgoing, happy person. So, mm. Uh, I tried to keep that, you know, up here, but, you know, back on the inside, I felt, you know, it was a struggle to do that. You know, it was definitely a struggle to do that. And some days easier than others, obviously, you know, depending on the sun, moon and stars, literally <laughs> the energies, right? So we've got this picture sort of coming together by the end of your naval service that you are like most young people, burning the candle on both ends. But that yes. slowly but surely, things are 
creeping up on you that you would have normally not expected as a direct result of a youthful, exuberant lifestyle. And yeah. that is sort of the, the restless legs or so neurological symptoms where the nerves in the body start to play funny games. Mm -hmm. The burning of the skin, now allodynia is the proper word for that. So yes. that, uh, um, that you simple touch causes pain. That's allodynia. Extreme pain, yes. Indeed. And that's that's sometimes that's that's what we see in one percent of injuries. Uh, mm -hmm. that nerves get irritated. And then if you have a shoulder injury, uh, a, a woman might it might be impossible for her to wear a bra because the right. weight of the bra is so excruciatingly painful. Uh, yes. So that is an example of, of such problems. Now, if you piss off nerves, for example, if you if you hit your funny bone here, so you hit your funny bone, next thing you know is tingling as hell here. Well, there's nothing wrong with your fingers. What you've done is you squished a nerve down there. So right. lesson to learn, don't squish nerves. Don't piss nerves off. The problem, of course, is that there are many, many ways that we can piss off nerves. Direct pressure. Cool. You can cut them, not good. So pain after surgery, for example. You can poison them with chemotherapy or with alcohol or with yeah. diabetes and so on. There's so many ways how we can piss off nerves. And yeah. one way or the other, they always say the same thing. You've got to be joking. I'm going to show you. So that's what happens when you annoy nerves. And that's so something has done exactly that. And something is going on in your body so already you can hear that as a doctor i know that i'm i'm getting the the christmas tree of alarm bells going off here <laughs> right. but did anyone else in your unit report the same thing did your friends did your co not that i was aware of hmm. not that i was did aware you, of did you say it did you open up yourself to someone no I, I no, it I really didn't say anything um about mm. about any of it because I just I didn't just thought it was me. Mm. Exactly. And that's the classic thing, because it yeah. comes up so insidiously slow. It yeah. is not just you wake up one day and all the things are suddenly there. No, right. they are just creeping in a bit here, creeping in a bit there, and yep. you consider it normal and you find, oh, is that really it? Is that now the end of my life? Oh, for fuck's sake, I'm 25 or whatever it is. So it is, I know exactly how it it is developing in your head. Yeah. So then discharge. And what now? What happened after discharge? Well, you know, I just, um, I kept, kept on, kept on, decided not to re-enlist, moved back to the East Coast and uh, to Virginia. I stayed in uh, active reserve, which is like a weekend warrior, basically. In, in Norfolk, you know, there's NAS Oceana and there's NAS Norfolk. And um, so I was working once a month still with the military. But on the regular days, I was in an auto body and repair shop, <laughs> which was interesting. But um, fun, interesting and also full of chemicals, <laughs> yeah, full of Bondo and paint spray and, you know, all kinds of chemicals. So what I had already experienced got compounded some more. So uh, it was about uh, probably about six to nine months ish, maybe a year at max where I just I. I was so exhausted and the stress was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Um, and so I just, I made an appointment with the VA and I'm like, there's something has to be, you know, give me some answers. Something has to be done, you know? And um, I wasn't at that time into, uh, I'd always taken some, um, you know, vitamins, Back then, supplement industry was not huge. You know, you had um, some, you know, like Shackley and different companies out there <laughs> like that. Um, back in that day, you know, and I took certain things like omega-3s. And um, other than that, I, I believed that everything else came from my food, which I didn't know what that was, but that's what I believed, <laughs> you know.
<laughs> well, okay. So, I mean, the story of the MREs that there's done dust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. High calorie, uh, let's try not to go to the toilet on in the middle of the battlefield. Kind of stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Please. So, intriguing, exactly. intriguing. Uh, yeah. Any soldier but, uh, will know about that. Yeah. So I went to the, I went to the VA and I set up an appointment with them and, uh, you know, they take every test possible mm -hmm. that they can take for you. And, um, and you're going great. We're finally going to do something here and something's going to happen. And you go back and they go, it's an emotional condition. It's in your head. We can prescribe you some Xanax for the whatever the drug was at the time. I think it was Xanax or, you know, one of those pills. And I was like, what? Excellent. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm so, like, no, I don't think so. I, so I didn't, you didn't get take, it. You didn't take anything? No, I didn't. I was so upset. I'm like literally crying walking out of the VA. And I'm like, All right, I'm like, angry crying you know like really angry crying I'm like in my head what are you talking about what do you mean in my head like are you saying I'm making this up or what are you saying exactly like I don't get that kind of um what do you call it you know <laughs> report <laughs> I just I don't get it that's not it's not in my head I promise you, I feel it in my body. It's definitely in my body. What am I supposed to do? Well, that's all we can suggest for you. Oh, God. And, oh, yeah. And but so then was, again, that was the 90s. That was, um, again, or mid-90s. Well, mid that now. was, a, yeah, mid to late 90s, because yeah. it was but, 1997 or 8 at yeah, that point. Yeah. Psychology is still something that is a bit weird for people who are a bit weird out there. Um, so it is, uh, the world has come a long way, uh, let's, let's say that. But even today, the reason I hold this show is because there is still so much, so much myth around mental health so much myth around uh all the kind of things that that we are talking in this show about addiction including uh, there's so much taboo shame guilt no one really talks about things so even now in 2020 there is so much work to be done leave alone yeah. 20 years ago when mm -hmm. yeah. there was even the infancy uh, that that kind of work Right. So there you are, and there there is this kind of you're young, you're there, you don't. It's not in my head, and and I don't I don't need help from some quack or whatever your your, your constructs up there are. Um, right, intriguing. So yeah, that pissed you off. <laughs> yeah, it, it it definitely did, but it also left me out of like, um, I guess I'm gonna have to figure this out myself mm -hmm. which i had no idea what that meant <laughs> at that time however someone's always in control and they bring people into your life that um that shake things up for you and that uh you know change things and get you you know um that challenge you you know to learn something that you didn't didn't know before didn't learn before and so <laughs> <laughs> um so who did who did walk into your life who was that one person <laughs> or persons yeah well um my bff to this day uh she's also my r d my research and development <laughs> i refer to her as d uh <laughs> and um so yeah, so I met uh, I met D at a um, at in a job. I I left the body shop because the the stress and the the chemicals. I was really getting super like, ooh, bad. I just it was so bad, and so I left that job and I went to go sell some property in Williamsburg, Virginia. And so I met D selling property, and um, 
we were very competitive salespeople and we're like watching each other from afar. And what is that girl doing? How does she make so many sales? I need to be her friend because I need to find out her secrets. <laughs> so yeah, so she came into my life. We became friends. And actually I had a plan that I wanted to go to Texas um, because in Texas, when you're uh, in the military, um, they will, once you've been out, you live in Texas for a year and become a, a resident of Texas. You can go to any of their schools uh, for free and you can also get your GI Bill. And so at that time, originally I was going to go to Texas A&M for veterinary medicine. However, um, the universe had something else in store for me. And so um, D and I became very good friends and um, she was crazy enough to you know, jump in the car and go to Texas with me over this. And so we, we set up there, I got a job with a veterinary clinic and uh, I really wanted to bring in, you know, we, we both liked the, the natural health stuff. And I had kind of shared with her some of the things that I was having and she had gone to nursing school and she was really smart and had all these, this knowledge. And so, um, I got a veterinary medicine, a job in a veterinary hospital as the manager and was going to learn from that doctor as much as I could, and then go to to Texas A&M a year later. Good plan, right? Well, she gets on with this company um, who was uh, semi-new to the Houston area, the greater Houston area. Then people don't know that um, Houston and the Rice District is this huge, huge medical district. And, um, you know, lots of well-known doctors there and very, you know, competitive and what have you. So this guy from India um, Manaj Manal, I think was his name. He, uh, lived in the Cayman Islands, but he had come to Texas and he had, um, opened up about 12 retail stores in the greater Houston area with his products that had been sold around the world, uh, grown in the Himalayas, organic, uh, Ayurvedic products, wonderful, beautiful products, um, great company. And, uh, she, because of her knowledge of, of they wanted people that had that kind of uh, experience that she had and the knowledge that she had. So they hired her uh, for one of their stores and, um, and she rose very quickly because she's a great salesperson <laughs> and she, she has a lot of knowledge. So she, you know, she sells through education, you know, and so I, but at the same time I was taking these products. So I'm working at the veterinary clinic. I'm taking the products and I'm becoming a product of their product. And she's the one who's kind of coaching me along on, on what to do. And, and we're studying everything. And we, you know, she's getting this, this education. And so after a couple of months, the veterinary doctor closed down his veterinary clinic, went to work with his wife. And they had a spot open up in, in the company in which they hired me on because it was about three months literally between the diet and the detox and the supplemental products literally turned my health around that fast. I mean, fast. And I was blown away. I was just blown away. And I, and so my belief alone and my story from using the products, which I still use to this day, um, and I, and I recommend them to people to this day, depending on what it is that they're dealing with. Um, I, we became the top two stores in Houston. <laughs> Good on you. And that is so, that is exactly, that's parallel to my journey. I, uh, maybe five years ago, I felt achy here and there. And I was, I was thinking, oh my God, is that it? You know, it's it's just I had a killer tendinitis, I had a chronic injuries playing up, and I thought, oh, for fuck's sake, this can't continue like that. And I had forever in my career referred uh, patients to Ben Boren, who is a nutritionist here in New Zealand, and he is a great guy. I met him on lectures, and and yeah, I I I, I loved the guy, and I loved his products. But yeah, it was half-hearted, quarter-hearted, really, that I sort of uh, followed myself in, in these footsteps. So then one day I, I called and said, look, man, I, I, I want to go all out. You please check me out and because I, I can't be it. <sighs> Several 
rounds of tests later and several um, education sessions later and some very good products. Suddenly my hay fever, gone. Shoulder injury, which shoulder injury? Achillotendinitis. Well, actually, you know, after 18 months of walking maybe 1500 steps a day in agony, it's pain-free walking and wow. all these kind of things. And you think, what the hell? What the hell? And it had to do with not just supplements. We're not guys. We're not talking about magic pills. Okay. Right. This is not just here, take this and you're going to be just fine. Bullshit. Yeah. No, right. this is no. actually looking at your health and figuring out what's going on with you. Do yeah. you, uh, the stuff that you eat, is that actually food or is it actually cardboard for the lack of a better word? Um, right. Then uh, once you actually reestablish food as what it is, something that is supposed to be nourishing your body and sustaining yeah. your body, um, then look at what are the ingredients and are these ingredients actually good for you? So that's the, the food allergies that many of us have but don't know about. So right. some people and dairy don't go well together, gluten, uh, sugar, all these kind of things. There are certain things that are not very good for you. And there are actually yeah. tests that you can do and there can clever people like Ben Boren or other nutritionists can figure that out for you. And we had Ben Boren on the show. So just go back around about uh, episode 50. We had Ben Boren on and um, where we discussed it in detail. So mm -hmm. there's the, the nutrition, regardless of what we do in this lab, is a huge, 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 huge contributor to our yeah. well-being. And uh, that is what you what you started experiencing. Yeah. So things started getting better. Now that's not the end of the story, isn't it? Because otherwise this would be a sales a sales show here. And now <laughs> right. may I show you this product here. And if you buy two, you get a free telephone. Right, 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 right. Uh, right yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that's not what we do yet. So no, how did the no. journey continue? Well, it, um, you know, we worked for the company for, for a while. Mind you, I had some, uh, I also had some PTSD from the military and that was kind of there. And, um, I, it wasn't anything that was super debilitating at that time, but I also became a, a Reiki master, which, uh, is an energy healer. If people are not aware with, of Reiki and, and what that is. And, um, it was something that I did because I believed I experienced it just like I did with the, the supplements. I experienced the, the, the shift of the energy of, um, of trauma that had been stored in my, uh, in the record of my cells, basically is, is kind of how I, I saw it. And it, although it was a slow process at that time it was it was slower moving and, and coming up and, and dealing with certain things I think because the triggers weren't there mm -hmm. when the triggers start coming then it it's you got to deal with it you know um so at that time the triggers weren't there um but when they when they did come back then I really started dealing with it and it was something that the energy really um because my body now was set up and so now I'm a very firm believer in empowering the masculine uh, energy that the the body, so that the feminine can uh, flow through and flow in alignment and and that kind of thing. So, we get into a little bit of of that. And this is now where a new journey starts, and that will be the intriguing part. So yeah. here we have got uh, Shannon Lee who was the young go-getter girl who proves herself in the Navy, uh, is having this cool adventure, and then suddenly turning into that not-so-cool Shannon Lee that actually doesn't feel like she belongs and doesn't, doesn't where, where things are no longer so right. And, okay, she turns the corner a little bit, but then suddenly doors start opening. And that is, that is what happens in so many of our lives. Suddenly transformation occurs. And because again, no one rings a big bell and says, here is the sign, there is where you go. Look there, there's the light. Right. Well, no, it doesn't happen like that. You know, something is happening, yeah. but, but it's transforming. And, and I guess the, the, the next part in our journey here is actually 
that we will talk about those things that really actually really make us tick inside and those things that that are sometimes hard to 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 put your fingers on energy what yeah. is energy you know what are vibrations what are frequencies what are these kind of things and i i on purpose have broken up our, our journey with shannon uh into these two distinct sessions because i wanted to show you guys out there that uh there is an interesting backstory that a lot of people do experience. Uh, Gulf War Syndrome has affected hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers around the world because whilst this Gulf War called, well, it's only just a label that has been placed upon soldiers who have had similar experiences, or shall I say similar vaccinations. Um, or similar exposures to chemicals, uh, etc. So I have met in my own journey, I've met people uh, such as Shannon myself, uh, and it is really, really hard. When you listen to them, there's a great deal of suffering. And then to actually find people such as Shannon who have turned a corner and have now found ways of dealing with chronic disease, altering their own state of minds, their own state of their bodies in such a powerful way, we would be stupid not to explore that. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in part two of Shannon's interview. So guys, look out for that. We're gonna bring Shannon back on rather ASAP and we'll probably give that a double episode uh, as, as a, as a uh, publication. So I, I don't let you wait until Christmas for, uh, for you to hear, okay, how did you get better? How did you, tell me, tell me. So that will come soon. Until then, guys, look after yourself. Shannon, thank you so much for sharing your, your, your story so far. I can't wait to hear the next part. Thank you so look, much. So fun. Look after yourself. Bye. Bye.